When Donald Trump became president, America witnessed a rise in white nationalism, in hate crimes, and in divisive conspiracy theories. But a lot of people thought that was a new phenomenon, that it was somehow reactionary behavior to Donald Trump's rhetoric and ideology. The fact is, that isn't true. The fact is, it's quite the opposite. You see, Donald Trump was put into office by white nationalism, by divisive conspiracy theories, and by a long history of white supremacy in this country. Conspiracies of war against white America, conspiracies of the government attacking white Christian America. These conspiracies have existed in white communities across America for decades. Donald Trump simply provided legitimacy to these conspiracies by using key and designated language in his campaign that caused white America to circle in a shark frenzy and cast their votes. Now how do I know this? How can I say this so confidently? Because I come from a white little town in North Carolina where I learned white supremacy. Racism is so casual where I'm from, it's culture. I'll say it again, racism is so casual, it's culture. And that culture breeds the next generation of white supremacists. And that's what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about that cycle of white supremacy that has yet to be broken. I want to talk about the silent complicity of white America whenever white supremacy is challenged. I want to talk about the ignorance of white America as it pertains to identifying and stopping white supremacy. Because you see, white supremacy is the single most dangerous thing in America to anybody who doesn't look like me. But every time white supremacy rears its ugly head, we treat it like it's a new dog doing new tricks. No, it's the same dog, same tricks. And I'm here to tell you that if we don't change how we treat the dog, it's going to keep doing the same trick. It's going to keep biting. I was raised in the mountains of western North Carolina in a white little neck of the woods, often referred to as a holler. I grew up with the Confederate flag in my front yard, and my neighbor had one in his, and this neighbor in his, and the guy down the road, and everywhere. That flag was a sign of our heritage. At least that's what I was told. What heritage, might you ask? A heritage of simple, hard-working Christian folk. Patriots who love their country and their neighbor. As long as your neighbor looks like you. Because I'm here to tell you, I didn't have any black neighbors. In fact, you had to go about 20, 30 minutes down the road before you got to the black neighborhood. Or where I'm from, they refer to as the bad part of town. You see, racism, where I'm from, is so casual, it's hidden. Hidden in plain sight. I didn't know it existed. The N-word was daily vocabulary. I didn't even know that was a bad word. Growing up, I learned that people who sag their pants are thugs. Growing up, I learned if you live in government-assisted housing, it's because you're too lazy to get a job and work hard like us. Growing up, I learned that these people get food stamps and sell drugs. You see, one day, my dad was going on a rant about just that when a guy knocked at my door. So I went and let him in. The guy went and sat with my dad, handed my dad some money. My dad weighed out the right amount of marijuana and gave it back to him, you know, a drug deal. And then my dad took the money from that drug deal and he put it in his wallet, right next to some red, yellow, blue, green food coupons. You may have heard of them, they're called food stamps. Did my dad see the hypocrisy of us having food stamps and selling drugs while he's telling me about these people getting food stamps and selling drugs? No, because my dad would explain it like this, son, I work hard and I pay taxes, so I deserve these food stamps. And I don't make enough money and I want to provide for you children, so I got to sell these drugs to make ends meet. You see the hypocrisy of that. The cognitive dissonance is cringeworthy. How could my dad, an otherwise intelligent man, be so ignorant? Easy. It's a toxic cycle of white supremacy and white ideology that has survived the test of time. You see, during slavery, only rich white people could afford to enslave other people. But 
to prevent the poor white people from empathizing with the plight of enslaved black people, what the rich white people did was this. They told the poor white people, hey, if you work hard, you can be like us. And what they did was they gave them management positions on the plantation, called them overseers. That way they were more important than the enslaved black people. The idea was simple. You might be poor, but hey, at least you ain't black. That ideology, that mindset has survived the test of time. Fast forward to my dad sitting in the living room ranting about these people with food stamps and drugs while selling drugs and using food stamps. I can hear it. We might be poor, but at least we ain't black. This is a cycle. And understanding that cycle, understanding that context, understanding this history is the key to dismantling white supremacy. Breaking that cycle is the key to defeating racism. Because I want you to understand, and this is very important, that although white America's busy spinning conspiracies of white America being targeted, there's no tangible quantifiable evidence to justify their case. But ironically, the same people that believe that will refute systemic oppression against the black community when there's tangible quantifiable evidence to prove it. The United States Department of Justice statistics show a black man is three times more likely to be killed by the police than a white man. The United States Sentencing Commission has proven that a black offender will receive a 19 percent longer sentence on average than a white offender same crime same criminal background. A black mother is three times four times more likely to die during childbirth than a white mother. 22 percent of black Americans live in poverty only nine percent of white Americans live in poverty. If you're a black American in this country, you're 2.5 times more likely to live in an environmental justice neighborhood. That means you're next to a power plant, next to a waste dump, next to a structure that poses significant health risk, regardless of your income. <laughs>